Last week, four people, including a police officer, were killed and at least 50 injured in an attack by a Muslim convert near Parliament in England. The perpetrator, Khalid Massoud, was killed by police as ISIS seems to be inspiring more and more of these lone wolf attacks, how vulnerable are we in the United States? And would the travel ban proposed by Donald Trump's administration keep these kinds of attacks at bay? What of the ongoing persecution of Christians in the Middle East? Here with analysis, I'm joined by the national security and foreign policy expert at Fox News and former foreign policy advisor to the president, Dr. Walid Ferris, welcome back. Thank you, Raymond. Thank Good you for having me. Let's start. What does this attack, another lone wolf attack, represent? What's the message here? Well, first of all, we're going to see more of these. We've seen the same before. We've seen it in Europe. We've seen it in the United States and, of course, uh, in the Middle East. These jihadists, if I may say, because yeah. that's what they are declaring, wants to send a message to their own base and constituency mm -hmm that they can shut down something, a street, mm. a parliament, an institution, maybe not the entire city, of course, yeah. or the country, but mm -hmm. they are sending a message for recruitment and for radicalization. Uh, they don't call it terrorism for nothing. I mean, it's to strike terror in people's hearts and, and, and as you say, blockade whole swaths of a city. And it does cause a paralysis. I mean, people just freak, and it's a terrible thing. Now, they have been for years, I'm talking about ISIS, who did take credit for this attack. They have for years been urging their people, get in a car, grab a knife, grab a machete, d t take a pail if you have to, just go and kill. Kill as many people as you can. Is this really, they're saying this guy is one of their soldiers. Is he really? Well, he's a soldier of the ideology which has been produced way before ISIS. I mean, the jihadist mm -hmm. ideology has been produced with Al-Qaeda, with many groups around the world. It comes from the old generations of the Muslim Brotherhood and other uh, Salafi jihadists. But basically, when ISIS shows on the ground in the Middle East that it is standing, it has a caliphate, it would incite and encourage these individual jihadis in the West to start acting. And at the same time, mm. when they act, it's going to encourage also more people to join ISIS on the ground. It is uh, actually, uh, you know, profitable. How do we in the West and in the United States particularly, how do we counteract this? Is there counter propaganda that we should be doing? How, how do we deal with the predominantly, and these are coming from Muslim communities, mostly youths, What's the answer here? Well, he, he's a convert, but uh, many are coming from communities where the jihadists are penetrating. See, the mm -hmm. issue is not the community. Mm -hmm. It's the movement. And that movement is able to penetrate because, number one, we need to stop them. Number two, we need to counter them. And I have always advocated the idea of Western governments working with Muslim reformer NGOs. This is your first line of defense on the inside. So you have counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and a war of ideas. The war of ideas we haven't done very well yet with it. And what's the end game? Why, why encourage these lone wolf, one-off attacks? A guy driving a truck, or, or you know, like this guy driving the thing and then you know stabbing people, going on a spree. What's the end game here? What is ISIS attempting to do aside from just lock down a part of the city or show its strength? Well, perpetuating the movement mm -hmm. and uh, aggrandizing the size. For example, what did it cost them? A man, one person, one car, mm -hmm. and one knife, right? Mm. And it has really shaken off uh, a whole city, or even with the cameras and the crews right. around the world. So they are waging a psychological warfare to counter them. What is very important here is basically to stop them from becoming jihadists before they act. And this is where we have not been very successful. I, I want to show you, this is the British advisor on terrorism in London. His name is Hai An Baba. And this is his solution. Listen to this. I want your reaction. Roll it. Actually, the way to tackle this extremism and any other form of extremism is actually to engage in the conversation between uh, a lot of the frustrated communities um, uh, and have a positive dialogue on how the two communities can find, uh, any uh, aggrieved communities can find common ground. Is there common ground here between Western civilization and these one-off attackers, these radicalized young people? The mistake made in the West by many academics and, of course, in the media, and that translates even sometimes to the bureaucracies, is we, we talk about a community. We don't talk right. about a movement. I mean, mm -hmm. if you engage with the community, who are you engaging with? Right. Are you engaging with the representative of the extremists or with the counter-jihadists? My critique has been, both here and in Europe, that we have abandoned 
those who have been fighting the jihadists to the advantage of those who are protecting them intellectually and politically. Mm -hmm. What about the Trump travel ban? We've been seeing a lot of coverage of this lately. The president tried to get this executive order through once before. The court stopped him. He revised it in his terminology, watered it down so that it could get through the courts. Guess what? Two more courts have weighed in. One affirmed it. The other, yeah. blocking. Will this do the job? Stopping this sort of jihadi attack in the future. You know, Raymond. Here's my take on the whole philosophy or doctrine mm -hmm. of the of the uh, of the ban. Number one, this is only a stage in a complex process. Mm -hmm. The ban by itself is only a stage. You are just shutting down an entrance to a particular type of countries. But you have to explain to the public why. Right. You have to explain who is in those seven or six countries or five. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that the public in the United States understand that there are jihadi networks who are using these countries, that you have allies in these countries. Mm -hmm. We have developed bridges to Egypt, to the Gulf, you know, to many societies in the region. Yeah. These forces have to be seen by the American public to understand that we're doing it with the Arab and Muslim. Will world. the travel ban make a difference, assuming it gets courts muster and can pass through the court system? Travel ban, if it goes through, number mm -hmm. one, you have to win the battle against ISIS in the Middle East in at mm -hmm. least three to four countries. Number two, you have to make sure that you are countering the networks here. Number three, you are bringing awareness to your allies in those countries. So citizens need to understand that the travel ban is one stage in many other mm -hmm. much more sophisticated. Both the United States and the UK recently outlawed electronic items in airplane cabins from six predominantly Muslim countries. Were you surprised by that? Is this targeting one group of countries to the exclusion of others? And why just these Muslim countries? See, the narrative is always an issue here. We call them, you know, <laughs> we are banning from Muslim countries. No, we are banning those laptops. It could be anybody coming from these countries, right. going through these countries. Basically, the government got information from one of the raids, without going into the details, mm -hmm. that this is going to be used against the United States. And you mm -hmm. realize that not many people have opposed it because it's technological. Mm -hmm. It's based on information. And it may not be for a long period of time because, meanwhile, the U.S. and its allies are developing the technologies to spot it. This is a race between the jihadists and the West about technology. Every time they discover one inch of breach, we will have to stop it and then bypass it. Wow. And so this is a constant, I mean, this it's is a, a moving constant target. Race. Absolutely. Talk about the Battle of Mosul for a moment, what we're seeing in Syria, uh, a lot of attention and concern mm -hmm. for the Christians, the Yazidis in the region. These are the minorities who have been forced to flee. I mean, they, they, they've destroyed their homeland in so many ways. What is the solution here? We have 3,000 troops now on the ground in Mosul. Mm -hmm. They seem to be making advances in Iraq uh, against ISIS. What's the answer here for these minority religious groups? Raymond, we've spoken about the persecution of yeah. Christian minorities and Yazidis, about the genocide that has been declared by the State Department and the United Nations. This is the window of opportunity for the international community led by the United States mm. and the Europeans and all our uh, Arab moderates to find a solution and we could be very close. Look, we are free, we are helping the Iraqis to free Mosul and the province around it. Among that province are the actual Christian areas of Nineveh, the Yazidis in Sinjar. So what is needed right now is that international forces would be protecting those zones. It doesn't have to be American, it could be European, it could be international, and then inviting these Christian minorities which, who are in exile in Kurdistan mm -hmm. and tell them to come back and then you organize them. Same could go for Syria. When we liberate Raqqa, there are many Christian areas that you could uh, protect. So now is the time to be smart and to create those protected zones. To keep them in the, in the, the region, at least, not have them flee to other parts of the well, world. Well, first you have to bring them to the zone. Right. They are very close to the zone. Bring them in, keep them in, protect them, train mm -hmm. them, equip them with all they need, organize their municipalities, and then you go to the political solution. Who would do this? Would the government, would the, would the United States and a coalition, NATO, who would do this? We have the largest coalition that just met a few days ago, and last week at least, here in Washington, D.C., and every partner was saying, well, give us more support, give us more support. This is the time mm -hmm. to tell all our partners, if you want our support, you want to also help those 
weak minorities within your own countries mm -hmm. to survive, and this is the way we're going to help you. We haven't seen much of an appetite to do that yet. I mean, I've spoken to people who've gone and visited these Christians in the UN camps. These refugee camps are nothing more than actually targeting uh, facilities because this small community is then surrounded by people who attack them in the camps. That's right. So they really have no safe haven. What do we do and who's leading that charge? There is a little bit of disorganization in the general camp that is mm -hmm. raising the issue of Middle East Christians. We hold great conferences here in Congress with oh, yeah. the NGOs and the foundations, and we talk about the principle. We want to protect them, we want to defend them, but then give me a plan on the ground. Right. And we are now giving a plan that State Department, DOD, White House, both bodies are on this. So this is the only thing, at least in Washington at this point in time, mm -hmm. where we could have a unity of both bodies supporting this initiative. So this could be the moment. This could be and should be the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, take a wider view. Give people a, a wider sense of what's at stake here. As we watch what happened in the, really the collapse of the Middle East, and we're seeing these refugees stream into Europe, is this the beginning or the end of this refugee crisis as we've known it over the last few years? Do you see it, the, the, mm. the tide of these refugees stemming? Or no? Brilliant question, Raymond. Basically, it's going to allow me to, to, to give you two answers. Mm. Number one, it could be, it could be very worse. Mm. Or it could be the beginning of the solution. I'll, and all has to do about who is going to control the areas freed from ISIS. Mm. If it's going to be sectarian militias linked to, for example, in this case, to Iran and to the extremist Shia uh, militias mm. or to Hezbollah, then, my friend, you're going to expect million more, millions and millions of Sunnis mm. hitting the ground, going to Turkey and into Europe. So we have to be very understanding that mm. the solution here is to make sure that moderates will be in charge of the areas liberated. If mm. we make that mistake, as we've done in Iraq in 2011, 2012, right. we are going to see the next war, the next mm. wave of migrants. Wow. And, and how is Europe reacting? We see in the Brexit afterglow, there's, there seems to be a real hue and cry at least from the British that I've spoken with uh, over the last few months, they want those borders secured. They do not want their British identity slipping away from them. Not that they don't care for these yeah. refugees or, or their well-being, no. but they feel, look, we have a limited, we, we're just a little island out here, and we can't afford to let everybody in. Look, the intellectual elites, you know, there and here, they are concerned about their concepts. It's more virtual, that we have refugees, we need to have all the refugees. They don't understand what is causing these uh, waves, and they do not want to give ideas as how to re resolve it. The public in general is, has good heart, they want to help, but at the same time they are afraid. The governments at this point in time understand that they need to solve it in the Middle East. That's why I see more Europeans, mm. French, British, Eastern Europeans, Hungarians, Poles, mm. ready to help in Iraq and in Syria yeah. to secure these enclaves and also to help with civil societies. If you okay. stop it in the Middle East, if you stop the drama in the Middle East, you don't have to have this crisis in Europe. Right. The, the refugee crisis suddenly vanishes. And, and again, people are entitled to live in their homeland. Yeah. They shouldn't be expelled and have to live in a diaspora somewhere. Waleed Ferris, as always, thank you for the insights. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again soon.